Hi everybody and welcome back to a new video on the Mirror Lesson channel. In this episode, I'm going to compare two Fujifilm telephoto zoom lenses with a focus on broad photography. And I've been wanting to do this comparison for a while, so let's get started. And here is the gear I'm going to talk about in this video. First, we have the two lenses, the 70-300mm and the 100-400mm. Then we have the two teleconverters and the two cameras I tested this equipment with, which are the X-T4 and X-S10. I also used the 100-400 many times before with other Fujifilm cameras such as the X-T1, X-T2 and so on, so you might see in the video sample images taken with these earlier models as well. As you can see, the 72-300 is much smaller and its weight is less than half that of the 100-400. The zoom mechanism is not internal, so both lenses extend when zooming in. The 7300 is weather sealed. The barrel is made of high grade plastics to keep the weight down, which inevitably gives you the feeling of a less premium product. The mount is metal, however. The zoom ring and focus ring are covered in rubber, and the zoom ring is more resistant than that of the 100 to 400 mm when rotated, but not to a point of being uncomfortable. The rotation arc is short, which means you can go very quickly from 70 to 300 mm and vice versa. There is a lock switch to prevent the lens from extending when carried around, and interestingly, this is a weak locking mechanism, and you just need to rotate the zoom ring to unlock the lens. Now, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but it is quite useful because when you mount the lens on the camera, you can forget about the lock switch and just rotate the ring and start using it. The aperture ring is smoother on the 70 to 300 mm, but also feels less precise. On the side, you find a focus limiter and a switch to go from automatic to manual aperture. There are no focus buttons and no optical stabilization switch. To activate or deactivate stabilization, you need to go in the menu of the camera, which is less convenient. The best workaround is to assign IS mode to a function button. Finally, the 7300 comes with a simple plastic hood. The 100 is made with plastic parts as well, but I found the build quality stronger overall, at least from a pure feeling point of view. The front element has a special coating to make it more repellent to water and easier to clean. I find the zoom ring on the 100-400 to be smoother in comparison to the smaller lens. Here as well, the rotation arc is small to go quickly from the shortest to longest focal length or vice versa. The lock switch is stronger, so you cannot unlock it by rotating the zoom ring. The aperture ring gives better feedback concerning the clicking mechanism and I find it to be a bit more precise overall. On the side you find the focus limiter switch, the auto manual aperture switch just like the 7300, but there is also an optical stabilization on and off switch, so you don't need to go in the camera's menu for that. Note that on recent Fujifilm models such as the X-T4 and X-S10, there is a setting called AF range limiter that lets you choose between two additional focus limiter presets, or you can set one manually. This works with any lens. One of the two presets has the same 5 meter to infinity range of the lens's switch, so not very useful. The custom mode is probably the most interesting option. It's a shame you can't recall these settings on the lens itself, but you can assign AF range limiter to a custom button. If you plan to use this feature, make sure to leave the switch on the lens to full. Because of the larger size, the 100 comes with a tripod mount that can be rotated 360 degrees around the barrel, or easily removed by losing these two mounting screws here. Note that the mount is not directly compatible with tripod heads such as Arca Swiss, so you need to attach a compatible plate. Finally, the hood of the 100-400mm has a locking mechanism and a window that allows you to access and rotate an optional polarizing filter. The two lenses, designed for Fujifilm's APS-C sensor, have a different range. 7300mm equals to approximately 105-450mm to on full frame, concerning the angle of view, and then the 100-400mm to lens corresponds to more or less 150-600mm to on full frame. With these images, you can see the difference between 70mm and 100mm, and then between 300mm and 400mm on the APS-C sensor. As for the variable fastest apertures, 
Here is how the two lenses behave as you increase the focal length. Let's begin with sharpness. As usual, I will only show you the most interesting results rather than every single image. At 70 mm, the 7300 peaks at f5.6, but the results at f4 and f8 are excellent. The level remains good at f11, whereas from f16, diffraction starts to decrease the quality. At f22, the image is soft. At 100 mm, the 7300 has a small advantage at f4.5. At 5.6, F8 and F11, the results are very similar. At F16, diffraction starts to decrease the quality, and at F22, both lenses deliver soft images, although the 100 to 400 does a bit better overall. At 200 mm, the 100 to 400 has a small advantage at F5 and F5.6. At F8, the difference is almost imperceptible. At f11, the 100-400 shows crisper results once again. The advantage remains at f16 and f22, although both lenses are affected by diffraction once again. At 300 mm and each lens's fast aperture, the level is very similar, whereas the 100-400 has a small edge at f5.6. At f8 and f11, the quality is very similar. The same trend continues at f16 and f22. Finally, at 400 mm, the quality of the 100 to 400 zoom is decent at f5.6, but the lens gives the best result at f8 and f11. The level is acceptable at f16 and soft at f22. It's rare that lenses of this kind deliver an outstanding smooth bokeh, but the two zooms don't do too bad in these regards. They look pretty similar, and even though the 7300 has slightly more rounded bokeh balls, the difference is difficult to detect. Depending on the position of the subject, the distance from the background and or elements around it, the autofocus area can appear a bit messy and more distracting. That is a characteristic I've seen in many lenses of this kind. There is isn't a lot left to comment when it comes to optical quality. Both lenses show no visible sign of chromatic aberration, distortion, while certainly corrected in camera, is basically non-existent in the final result. Both lenses show mild vignetting at the fastest aperture, at the shortest and longest focal length, but closing the aperture by one stop is enough to get rid of it. Finally, you need a pretty strong source of light entering the lenses directly to see invasive flares. The 7300 features one linear focus motor, whereas the 100-400 has two linear motors, which makes sense, I guess, because there are larger elements to move inside the barrel. Practically speaking, though, I didn't find a substantial difference between the two lenses. In single autofocus, with static or slow-moving subjects, both lenses focus fast and accurately, and it's up to the F system of your Fujifilm camera to do the rest. I had no specific problems with small birds perched on a tree, or more distant animals, using the XS10 and the XT4, but also all the Fujifilm cameras. With birds in flight and my usual red kites test, the XS10 and XT4 gave me a very similar keeper rate with the 70-300mm, and the score matches the one I previously had when testing the XT4 with the 100-400mm. Here are the results I got with each lens and camera combination. Note that a small difference of 2% or 3% is not that relevant. The first number only includes images that are perfectly sharp, whereas the second number also includes slightly soft photos. You can find out more about my Birds in Flight test as well as the best settings to use for Fujifilm cameras by visiting my website. I'll leave the links in the description. Concerning the minimum focus distance, the 7300 has more magnification possibilities and, at 300mm, you're almost in semi-macro territory. Concerning the manual focus experience, the fly-by-wire focus ring of the 100-400 is smoother and more precise to use. That of the 7300 produces small jumps as you increase or decrease the focus distance, a problem I've seen with various Fujifilm lenses. It can be more annoying if you need to nail focus very precisely.
The 7300 has a rating of 5.5 stops of compensation, whereas the 100 to 400 is slightly behind with 5 stops of compensation. However, when the 100 to 400 is paired with XT4 or the XS10 that feature in body image stabilization, the rating goes up to 5.5 stops. With the XH1, on the other hand, it remains unchanged. To see how far I could go using slow shutter speeds with the two lenses, I took 10 shots at different focal length and shutter speed, then I calculated the keeper rate for each. Here are the results. In short, you need to stay above 1 8 of a second at 70mm or 1 30 of a second at 300mm to have a good keeper rate when using the 7300. With the 100 400, forget anything slower than 1 15 of a second and when shooting at 300mm and 400mm, you need to work at 1 60 of a second or faster to have a decent keeper rate. Neither lens or camera allow you to set different settings depending on your movements, like for example compensating only vertically while panning horizontally. However, according to Fujifilm, the 100 to 400 can automatically detect the type of movement the photographer makes and compensate accordingly. I couldn't find the same information for the 7300mm, so I assume it doesn't behave in the same way. Indeed, during my birds in flight test, I found a few images with motion blur when using the 7300 with optical stabilization activated. To be fair, there were only a few photos out of the thousands I captured, and it happened when the birds suddenly changed direction and I abruptly changed my movement to keep following it. Otherwise, leaving the stabilization on didn't give me any problems with either lenses. That said, for erratic and unpredictable subjects, it is better to use a safe shutter speed and leave optical stabilization off, especially on the smaller lens. The two lenses are compatible with the 1.4x and the 2 times teleconverters. Here are the range and apertures you get with each on the two lenses. And here is the difference at the telephoto end with each lens and converter. On the 7300, the 1.4x converter retains a good level of sharpness at f8 and f11. Results are decent at f16, but softer from f22. The 2x teleconverter decreases the quality a little, but the image looks good at f11 and decent at f16. From f22, diffraction is more visible once again. On the 100 to 400, the best performance is found at f11 and f16 for the 1.4x teleconverter and f16, f22 for the 2x teleconverter. I found the autofocus performance to slow down a bit, especially with birds in flight. At times, the cameras took more time to refocus properly, especially with the 2 times teleconverter. To be fair though, by the time I started using the converters, the light got worse. The 7300mm comes at a very attractive price, whereas the 100-400mm is much more expensive. And if you want the converters, these are the costs you need to add. A quick word about the two main cameras I tested the two lenses with. The X-T4 and X-S10 have the same 26 megapixel sensor, same autofocus system, same continuous shooting speed, so when it comes to quality and performance, they behave in the same way. The XS10 main strength is the larger grip at the front, and given the small dimensions of the camera, when paired with the 7300, it becomes a nice compact setup for wildlife and bird photography. Plus, both the camera and the lens have a very competitive price. The viewfinder is good, but only average by today's standards, and I find it a bit small personally. Also, I'm not crazy on the entire ergonomics of the camera, I find some of the buttons to be really small, and the autofocus joystick can lack some precision. Also, the XS10 is not weather sealed. The XT4 feels more solid, it has more buttons and dials, including the classic shutter speed dial that has been a signature of Fujifilm cameras. It has a larger EVF, and overall, I find the controls better positioned 
and more satisfying to use. The X-T4 is weather sealed and has a larger battery that lasts for longer in comparison to that of the X-S10. It also has two SD card slots with a dedicated compartment on the side, unlike the X-S10 where you have to access the card in the battery compartment. As for the negatives, it's mainly about the lack of a more prominent grip at the front, which makes the camera less comfortable to use with large lenses such as the 100-400mm. It is also more expensive than the X-S10. There are other lenses designed for the Fujifilm X-Series that are part of the long telephoto lens category. We have the older 55-200mm with less reach and no teleconverters compatibility and the superb but very expensive 200mm f2. A new 150-600mm is also in development, which means that Fujifilm really believes there is a place for its APS-C cameras in the wildlife and bird photography market. For now though, the 70-300mm and the 100-400mm are the best options you can find because they offer great flexibility when it comes to zoom range, performance and price. Now the question is, is there a clear winner between the two? And I have to admit, the 70-300mm ticks all the boxes for me. Optically, it is at the same level of the 100-400 and the autofocus performance has nothing to envy either. You also get better close-up capabilities and Fujifilm was smart to make the lens compatible with the two teleconverters. Some of you might not like the large use of plastic for the construction, but the advantage is a much lighter and smaller lens and it still comes with weather sealing for a much lower price. The 100-400 is a lens I know better because I tested it many times since it came out in 2016 and not just for birds but also football and rally. It never disappointed me, surely it is bigger but it offers a long reach at the telephoto end, feels more robust, and has a few extra features such as the optical stabilization switch and the filter window on the hood. That said, with the arrival of the 7300mm, now you need to look at the details to decide if double the price and weight are justified. And I suspect that many photographers will be absolutely fine with the smaller lens. As always, thank you for watching. Don't hesitate to write a comment if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.